yeah, I'm going to go back on Dragon Conventions, uh, which now Alex has led me to believe may not be so crazy, but, you know, uh, the main thing which is different is for me, rho will be the sum, half the sum of the positive roots, dominant is the dominant chamber. Uh, the only thing which is changing is the way in which we encode line bundles and the sheet things, right? So, like, if you have a representation, you can encode. Uh, so, given a representation of G, you can build this uh, constant with an action of fracking, or with an action of big G, you build this echo variant G. Uh, and what I really would like is that the line bundle showing up in this thing have highest weight, like have the weights that show up in this representation. So, wait, wait, is B, B sub lambda, what is B sub lambda? So, so where does the highest? The G module? Uh, the G module, yeah, G module. Wait, so don't you want like L, like the ear just, don't you want B of lambda to be like the two global sections of that? I want, what do you want? Yeah, so so I want. Uh, what do you want the global sections of fancy music? Global sections of oh, this is what I want. That's what you think. Okay. Yeah. How are you defining global lambda? And so I'm defining all, I mean, Essentially, I'm defining all the lambda to make this. <laughs> Maybe that's a, which I think is, you need to just do the, the associated construction, the associated bundle construction, but you need to induce a, a dual and double norm on your, on your way. Okay. But yeah, it's more that I, I really want this to hold. And all of this can, all of this subtlety is just like how you encode your line bundle and how you set up your notation. And I'm sort of fixing it so that this whole because we make things easy to see. Um, and maybe if I was more in line with my minus ones, I could do it. Yeah. Uh, and so in this picture, you know, dominant tone, regular dominant part, what I'm called the row dominant. I don't know, is there a I don't know if there's a better better name for that, but these are the ones which are if you focus here, this would be your dominant tone. Um, and so for the row shifted action, you know. Like the road shift action fixes this point. So these would be regular dominant with respect to the road shift action. Okay. Um, but yeah, so essentially fixed convention such that this one. Now I'll give you the theorem and then we'll just go over how to prove it. Oh. Okay. An integral way. And so we saw the first part of this the other day, um, which, so maybe I'll just say the whole thing. Zero or all I, if lambda is not uh, rho regular. Which is, you know, if no meter, uh, lambda plus rho is not regular. Right. So, in other words, if it lies on one of these walls in this picture, so these these big lines are the reflection axes. These are the reflection axes for the row shifted action. And we're saying that if your weight lies on one of these walls, there's no form wall here. Okay. And then if lambda is row regular, in other words, the other case with w dot lambda um, dominant. Then H Lambda zero not equal to the length. In other words, it vanishes almost everywhere. And H link W. Uh, 
nice and over to it. Like, so highest weight. Okay, so this was sort of what I wanted the convention for, just so we can say the sections of whole lambda is the thing of highest weight. And I'm willing to sacrifice convenience in order to have everything pointing up. Everything like behind you. Uh, so I'm going to be so that I can be so we don't die. Yes. So. Okay. Yeah, so this is sort of yeah, basically saying all line bundles on GMOD, cohomology vanishes almost everywhere. When it doesn't vanish, we can say exactly where it is. We know exactly what degree it doesn't vanish in, and we know exactly what the cohomology is. So in other words, it's the complete description of all the cohomology, all line bundles on GMOD. Okay, so um now, maybe I'll just say it. So the strategy to prove this is going to be prove all of the statements for things in the row dominant chamber. Right? And then show that we can like translate around to get all of the other chambers. So okay, so let's prove it in the row dominant chamber. Now we basically did this last time, but I am a little bit I mean, I got sort of confused because it wasn't clear to me whether we proved last time that we were for all of this or just for the like dominant weights. Um, there may have been a hidden erosion, but I'll say it feels like there is non trivial content to the fact that homology vanishes in this small, lower than dominant uh, part, right? Like, why does the homology of O of minus rho vanish everywhere? That, like, that is actually something to prove. Okay, um, so now I want to introduce the picture of how, how I'm thinking about this. So we're going to be dealing with these D lambdas. And the way we've set it up, so any representation is going to have, okay, this is our, yeah, any representation will have a highest weight. Say it's here, say it's set on the table, and then it'll have maybe the, W dot orbits. So I'm going to think of this. If this is our lambda, I want to think of V lambda as basically being sort of like this convex set that's in the hull of all of these things. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, it's sort of like we're going to use the weights which occur in V lambda. And we're really just going to care about the extreme ones. So it doesn't really matter what they are. Uh, but you need to remember that we have, you know, this is a centrally symmetric convex thing, and we're going to be looking at extreme points. Uh, and so the weights that occur in this box, so let's say we have a new one here, are the weights in the filtration uh, sub quotients over new or uh, so you know, we build a big thing, it's got a filtration and sub quotients, and we're thinking about it as all those sub quotients live in this region. And then it's easy to see that if we you know, shift this, so then if we consider like uh, you know, a shift by some weight u, this is exactly uh, take this box, uh, shift it, say, out to here. So in this way, if we take a highest weight representation and we tend to group with something, we can just see what the weights are, or we see in the region in which they live. And so the reason why this is going to be important to us is that, uh, so basically, if you want to know, like we're going to use this trick 
where you look at the global sections or just the sections of the sheet and you look at how the Liao graphs. And so important reminder is that the like central character on O lambda. So this gives a central character I lambda and I lambda equals U if and only if they're in the same row dot or W dot orbit. Or some variable. I think you don't want it to do all the 30 zero from the definition. And give them that you just want all the sections to be. You want the goal section to that to be the And O lambda will then be the quotient of the little to be half of it. You definitely want to. So you just want over to be. So you want the you want the global section to be even. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. True, true, true. Okay. So now it's weird is that like well maybe it's not weird, like the top of it as a geographic range of people, the top will be O of that, which is fine, that's what you want. But it should just be O of X and me. O of X Right, right, because you want the global sections on it to be, yeah. Okay, great. And then the top of it is that. Okay, great, great. So then where, okay, maybe I'll see where the W, w nodes will come up later uh, to be awful, but okay, good for now. This okay, sweet. So the game basically is we're going to find highest weight representations and shifts of them okay, such that we can control the weights which occur. So and the idea being, because this is like the row shifted dot action, we're going to take something symmetric about the zero, we're going to move it around, and then we're going to see where its orbits are with respect to this row shifted action. And then by taking uh, central characters, Lee algebra, you can get the short exact sequences, you can get the band of same as the unique. Okay. So. Uh, this is fine. Maybe I'll. I'm a bit here and I'm making benches. Oh, also, I'll just say because I feel like uh, there are a lot of lefts and rights in this picture. Um, one thing that I find really helpful for remembering the way in which things go is that these B lenders surject onto a positive thing. So they're like, Line the line bundle quotient is the thing which has sections, and the line bundle sub is the thing which doesn't have it. Oh, 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 if the line bundle is fiber at the point B corresponds to the representation of weight W not mu. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this picture, what's the B submodule? The, the unique B one dimensional submodule is a weight lambda. It's now to get a line bundle of that, it's a, you're going to write it as W not. You just can always apply the B. But if you're thinking in terms of like hybridian speech, so like when you're thinking in terms of this corresponding to the variant sheets and B modules, really. The one dimensional sub on the circle where it comes from the You're just multiplying everything with W. And then the top would usually correspond to W not lambda. Oh, okay. Okay. Not, everything is getting. Uh -huh. And I really want the top to correspond to that's fine. Okay. Lambda, because then you can okay, because then you can say, okay, all of yeah, because you know, in the case of P1, you have this sequence. And in all cases, if you've got a trivial thing in the middle, it will surge onto the thing that has global sections. Uh, so that's sort of, yeah. The way in which I keep it straight, which way things go. Uh, right, okay, because this is the lowest way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, great. Great, great, great. You basically, like, it's almost like you're really thinking about it in terms of the opposite. And then it becomes, like, really that's what, Mm -hmm. You're doing high speed theory, but sort of look like you're both from. Yeah, oh, okay, okay. This may, this may screw. Maybe no, I'll, 
no, 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 but I think there's some points where I assume that the highest weight were. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think, I think we are. Uh, okay. So, okay. So, first, let's just explain why this vanishing holds. So, we need to show that in this region, go on the vanishes. So, the way we're going to do that, let's say we pick something here. And we want to show that it's got all the vanishes. When you say this region, you're pointing at very big. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. The road dominant region. Oh, so including the including walls. including the walls. Yeah. So yeah. this isn't just the like net Okay. Oh, so for this, uh, okay. So we want to take take something here. Let's pick. We'll pick one of these extreme ones because it's the, the hardest to take. And then you essentially want to uh, let's call that lambda. You want to embed. Okay, so here's where I can uh, our lambda inside the here. Oh, but W north. Uh, okay. Essentially, you want to embed your line bundle inside something here. So, so we don't know the example yet, but you want to embed your. So let's type check. Does this make sense? Uh, the weight showing up here. The we need to do like a sum for each other and provide a new sum. So it should be the minimal thing. So I yeah. So I'm I'm thinking about it as uh but yeah. I can actually just draw it in this picture. Uh, this one will be random plus row, and then we'll have weights. The row weights will be this, 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 and this. Will be this, this. Oh, oh, you okay. Via yeah. row, oh, okay. so the lowest weight of the row minus row, and and so now you just add row plus lambda, so now the lowest weight of the lambda. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the yeah. picture is that we take the like the row box and we shift it up so that the lowest part is now lambda. Okay, and so there is an inclusion here. Uh, by the general general picture that we have the lowest thing here, uh, and then in order to check, so if we knew the cohomology of this band, and we knew that this was a sum n as sheaves, we would be done. Okay, so the claim is that one uh, this is a sum n. As sheaves, not quasi coherent sheaves, so just as sheaves. And then two, uh, which I zero, I Okay, so first to check that it's a sum n. This boils down to showing that uh, when we consider the like central action on this. We just need to show that this is the only member in its own row orbit. Okay, so because we're going to have line bundles showing up, we know that two line bundles are the same center character, they're in the same W dot orbit. So we just need to show this is the unique thing in its own orbit. So well, why does that know that it's a lambda? Yeah, so it's because uh, so I think I think we first need the argument that for any G equivariant change of this form, it splits into uh, its central characters for the action of the center of G. So this is like if we if we knew assumed everything was finite dimensional and you just have like an algebra acting or something. That thing will decompose according to the central idempotence of that algebra. Because the center of U of G isn't finite dimensional, there's an extra argument you need to make, like a finiteness thing, in order to get this decomposition. But you want to say it splits into its central component. 
generalized eigenspaces for the central uh, characters. Uh, it splits us up the module over the center. Yes. And in fact, as a uh, sheet with an action of this algebra, but not. So, yeah, so the idea is like the uh, universal enveloping algebra of E and the center of that acts on the sections of the sheet, but just as sheaves of abelian groups or sheaves of vector sets. So it doesn't preserve the like OX module structure. And that's why you don't get splittings in that room, but you do get splittings in sheaves. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so then you just need to check that it's the own, it's the unique thing in its row orbit. So I'll, I'll write this down, uh, but it's not. Row is new, then new is in the row. Well, I'll say this mean is a weight of the broken thing. Okay, matching things up. And these things are both positive with respect to the basis of simple roots. So, oh yeah, and uh, so this lambda is uh, Yeah. Wait. So, because lambda is what's up? The lambda. So we need to show the W dot order. So if you want to move the lambda over and get W of lambda plus row minus lambda plus row, and then that would be new. And that should be equal to new, which should be or it should be all equal to new plus row, which is positive. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So, uh, you just yeah, 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 yeah. this thing is positive. Yeah. Okay. So, and remember, this this W dot action is just shifting how it looks, but the notion of positivity is invariant in the row shift. So, then you just need to check that you can't have W dot something equals something plus strictly positive. Uh, we've got something in this chamber. Like if we imagine this was our, our base point for W action, we've got something in this chamber, we apply W to it, and we get something which is positive with respect to this basis. And one can't show that one can show that that can't by considering inner products. So yeah, so the the, the, dot, the dot action here is secretly a red pair. Just move over row minus w row, and you get w of lambda plus row minus lambda plus row, and that's negative because lambda plus row is is uh, lies in your dominant row. Lambda plus row is dominant, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean that thing is the sum of negative roots, and on the right hand side you have something which is the sum of positive roots, as you said, and the negative. Right, right. So. Row. And we're done. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, so this is essentially the game in this in this picture. You like, you know, find the highest value representation, you shift it around, and then you argue whether it's only one or maybe two w dot orbs. Okay, so okay, and so then you know, if you believe this. Then it reduces to showing that this vanishes. But now row plus, well, this is dominant in the usual sense. So we did prove this last time, but 
you know, you can prove this by a similar argument, you just now need to pick a different highest weight representation. So, yeah, so you can, you, know, you can prove this second part by saying that if lambda is dominant, then we can find a split. So Jack can split a sheet from the trivial bundle, and then you can just say, okay, well, the trivial OX module has vanishing cohomology. You can prove that by taking a different uh, highest weight module, but I don't think I'll do that. Uh, so I'll just say that you know, this reduces it to the case of the dominant, uh, and then in the dominant case, you have this immediately, which reduces it to the case of OX, and then you can pick a different thing if you want to show that OX has no higher cohomology. But I also want to give a much better, much better proof. So, oh, okay. Before I give you much better proof, I'll also give a, so, you know, what did we need to do to prove all the statements for this work? We needed that high cohomology vanish, which we've now done. But we also needed that uh, H0 was the highest weight representation, the thing that we think it was. Uh, all of these, I mean, to say we proved last time. So the thing is we just need to show that these matter. In other words, there are no global sections if something isn't in the dominant chamber. Now, this has a nice proof. This has like a, a nice geometric way to see that. So this is lambda not dominant implies global sections trivial. Okay, so the proof for this is let S be a global section. Okay, if it's non-zero, then it doesn't vanish at some Borel. Okay. So S not equal zero at X, which is associated to BX. But that means that S uh, okay, and so now on a fly variety, we have the geometric interpretation of codes, of simple codes. So this is, for each point in the flag variety, there are distinguished P1s passing through that point. Okay, so in projective variety, we've got distinguished rational curves, and they're indexed by codes. So through uh, X, we have copies of P1, alpha check, indexed by codes, and then the geometric interpretation of this pairing, right? We have a line bundle, we have codes. The line bundle is indexed by a weight. Codes pair with weights to give numbers. Line bundles pair with one-dimensional algebraic varieties to give numbers by taking the degree. So in other words, the degree of, of lambda restricted to the check, Lambda. And, and this is sort of a not very difficult exercise in number of definitions, um, but it's a really nice like geometric way to see what codes are and what this and what dominance means. Because from this we see that okay, if we had a global section, then we would have a global section on all of these line bundles that's non-zero, right? We'd have non-zero global sections of all these line bundles. But a line bundle on P1 can only have a non-zero global section if it's positive degree. Oh, sorry, non-negative degree. So that tells us that all of these must be non-negative. So here, so you see that like having global sections is exactly equivalent to pairing non-negatively with all of your simple codes. And so that, yeah, this is like uh, why it's nice that the two notions of positivity agree. But now I want to I want to give the really nice proof. So okay. So alternatively, let's use theorem, which is Podara vanishing. So I like this perspective because I can internalize what this theorem means in an example. So this is some vanishing theorem of coherent cohomology. What does that mean? We can actually see this. So the statement is that. And there's only value in characteristic zero. 
L ample on X an arbitrary variety, then H I X L tensor omega X is zero, I greater than zero. All right, so this is saying, given something ample, if it were very ample, you'd know that high homology vanishes. If it's ample, you twist by this, then you know that high homology vanishes. Okay. So what is WX here? Oh, sorry, where WX equals the uh, nth power of the cotangent bundle. So the, the, the dim X, which is also known as the like dualizing field, which is also like the thing which shows up in also called the canonical key. If the thing which shows up in stair duality, there's like a shift that you have to do. Um, okay. And is it possible to say what ample means? Oh, yes, sorry. So ample, uh, yeah, the idea is if you have a line bundle, it's very ample if the like if the global sections of that line bundle like if uh, basically if, if you have enough global sections of that line in a precise sense. So the idea is if you have lots of global sections, you could try and embed your space in the like projectivization of the space of global sections. In other words, you say, okay, for each point in my space, tell me what all of the global sections do to that point. And that gives you a map to some projective space. If your line model is very ample, that's an embedding. And then a line model is ample if some tensor power of it is very ample. Uh, another thing is that ampleness can also be characterized uh, cohomologically as take any quasi coherent sheet. If you tensor it enough times with L, like you tensor it with L to the N, you can kill cohomology, then L is ample. So you can think of like ample line bundles as things that you can twist by and kill cohomology if you twist enough times. Um, but it's really nice in that, like, in this example, we can explicitly say all of these, we can explicitly say what everything here is, um, which is what we'll do. So in this case, we know what our line numbers are. And, okay, so uh, for instance, we can see that the trivial bundle isn't going to be ample because the tensoring with the trivial bundle doesn't do anything. Right. If we tensor with things we need to kill cohomology, tensoring has to like give things more global sections. Right. So you know, this will be not be M. Similarly, this uh, these things also won't be M. But it turns out anything in the regular dominant chamber is M. So in this picture, uh, ample. So this is for G mod B, ample, if and only if very ample. So if and only if is regular dominant. Okay, so great, and now, on G mod B, the canonical sheet is O of minus two rho. So this is just a computation you can, you can check. And so then putting this together, this says that if you take something which is regular and dominant and you shift it down by two rho, all of your higher homology matches. Okay, but what does that mean? Well, it takes me regular dominant shift shifted down by two rho. That's exactly the chamber we were trying to show. So, so uh, if lambda is dominant, then uh, hi on x of lambda plus rho minus two rho equals zero, I agree with zero, by this vanishing thing.
right? So if we had something dominant, we get something regularly dominant, therefore ample, and then we shift it down by the uh, canonical sheet, and then the error of vanishing kicks in and tells us precisely the vanishing which we want it to. And so this also this also says that if you're on like like you know, algebraic varieties, I would say coming to three types. We've got the positive ones, the like like positive curvature, positive like projective spaces. Then you've got the like flat things, and then you've got general type, like hyperbolic things. And what this is saying is that if you're in one of the like positive types, like flag manifolds, projective spaces, those are the ones where you expect your canonical sheet to be anti ample. So those are the ones where you expect your canonical sheet to not have any sections. And Kadira vanishing in that case is saying if you look at your ample cone, so your ample line models, you can actually shift down and you'll still have cohomological vanishing. So in this, like, uh, if, all, if your varieties are positive, you're in this like positive world of algebraic geometry, then Kodaro vanishing is telling you you've got more vanishing than you would expect. And you can see if you're in a world where your canonical sheet were ample, you might have less vanishing than you would expect. And you can see that for curves, if you uh, start thinking about like, when is it a line model on a curve very ample, you need to check. It. And it, yeah, this, this sort of Kodaro vanishing fix it. Okay. Uh, any more questions about this one? So you said a very basic question. So if you take one of these what, weights mm -hmm. and you take the line level corresponding to it, and then you take the line level corresponding to a different weight, and you tend to them over OX, you just get the line level mm -hmm. corresponding to the weight. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So now let's try and do the other side of Robert Bob. So this is the sort of general length statement saying that you have a homology showing up in high degrees, but only in one type, if at all. So and this all sort of boils down to the following form. So if w dot lambda is rho dominant, w minimal length, yeah, w minimal length, then h i w lambda zero for i is greater than the length of w. So yeah, this is sort of like a because we're going to prove it by induction and we need this stepping stone. But this stepping stone is actually almost equivalent to the whole result. So I'll just say briefly why. Like, one nice thing is that said duality, so this is a, a statement about the cohomology of a line bundle and its dual, where you shift by the phenomenal sheet. In this picture, said duality is reflection through minus one. And so and because of that, like, so if you knew that this were true, and you knew that said duality was reflection through minus rho, this actually immediately tells you it can only be supported in one degree. So, so let's, okay, so let's plot that out, because I, I think this is really nice. It's like, once you know this, said duality essentially tells you the same. So, This is a lambda h minus i so and so when you put these together, you can see that this can only vanish if you have uh, okay, maybe yeah. 
let's just give a name to this number. So this is the length of minimal length of W such that but we got lambda is dominant. Uh, right, and so then this statement is saying that it vanishes greater than this uh, n of length. So the density duality is H of W naught minus I X. equals zero high grade random. And so now we need to swap the roles of lambda and lambda and row. Okay, so what does this tell us? From this, we know that our cohomology vanishes if it's too high, if it's, if it's above this point. And from this, we see that it vanishes if it's too low. Right? And putting these together, we get that hi could only possibly be non zero if the this n lambda minus two rho plus n of lambda equals the length of W naught, as in the dimension of the flag. But this condition holds if and only if lambda is uh, regular, I guess, dot regular. So once we know this lemma, the symmetry of said duality tells you that you have enough vanishing that if your thing isn't regular, it can't have any problem, which is quite nice. So yeah, this lemma is really the like key thing. And it also says that if it is regular, it will only be concentrated in one degree. It's only one possible spot where it could be not zero. Uh, now I'll, maybe I'll stop and have a break there. Okay, so probably I don't know. I don't I don't think it would be that beneficial to go over the full proof of this later part. Like I mean, maybe potentially Alex can have more insight to it, but I uh, don't have that much insight into why it works. It's sort of like I can draw a picture and then say, okay, yeah, this picture might be right. And then to prove it, you just need to do some combinatorics in the root system. Um, but yeah, so it depends if you feel like you're doing that completely. Otherwise, I can questions or discussion. Um, but okay, so we're trying to prove the second part of world by one. So this is the Vanishing statement, and I would say uh, almost essentially boils down to this lemma, but even more so, we just need to show that again, so we know what n of lambda is. The claim is that the lambda with n of lambda equals k, we can find a short exact sequence. Of sheaves. Oh, uh, and I should also say lambda is less than less alpha of lambda, alpha simple root. Simple root. Okay, so, so this is like we're starting with something which is not dominant, and then we're, we're moving it up to be in the dominant point. And you know, if we move up by a simple reflection, that makes it more dominant. Then the claim is we can find short exact sequence of sheaves of S alpha. This such that uh, oh, sorry, um, H pi C zero. I is greater than a minus one. Now, if we take for a moment that we can find such a short exact sequence, well, this is one step closer to being dominant 
So this thing here, right? So n of s alpha dot lambda equal to k minus one. So the cohomology of this vanishes in degrees greater than k minus one. This also vanishes in degrees greater than k minus one. And okay, great. And so that says that this thing can have at most up to degree k, like vanishes in degrees greater than k from the long exact sequence in chief cohomology. So in other words, if we can justify why enough of these short exact sequences exist, then we're happy by enough and long exact sequences. Happy? Okay, so, and but we've already seen that like, uh, yeah, this is essentially gonna come about from a eigenspace decomposition of one of these, um, you know, you build this bundle, you shift it, and then you take an eigenspace with respect to the, uh, the central action. And yeah, so why why we can actually do this? I want to talk to Dragon about because you've now convinced you, I don't know convinced me a bit that it's like like taking eigenchief decompositions is not something you can do for free. Uh, but let's assume that we can uh, and assume that it all works. So then we just need to find representations which do what we want. So I'm going to draw. Picture. So the idea is say this is our lambda. And the good thing is, at least for this one, we can avoid, we can ignore the row shifts completely, right? We can pretend that nothing is shifted if we want, because this is now going to be a geometric statement saying that we can like find the weights of a representation. We can move them around somewhere such that lambda and S alpha of lambda. Are the only things which show up and do that in a, in a nice way. So let's say we do it here, and let's say this is our uh, dominant chamber. This is our dominant chamber. So these are our roots. Okay, so then we would go here to here, and that would be minimal. So for instance, we took a rep we want to claim that there's some representation which is probably as you know, we take some representation, say we center it here, some big hexagon, such that the only things in the orbit are lambda and s alpha lambda. Okay. So this is just can we find a finite dimensional representation with weights that are in this box, such that these two are extremal, and they are the only things in the orbit of lambda. What do you mean? Oh, oh, and the, and the full W. Yeah. yeah. W, uh, w representation. Yeah. 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 So, like, this also contains this guy. And from this picture, it's like, okay, well, that is not like, this complex box, but we just need to argue why we can find weights which do this in general. Wait, so that says that they have the same action by the center here in the same orbit. And yes. then uh, how does that give us the exact sequence? Yeah, so if we had uh, this rep this representation, we would then get the like shifted effect. Oh, okay, sorry, you're right. And then we would need to also know something about where it was based. So like we take this F and then we take the like lambda eigenspace. And we know that it, we have this. Like we know that the, the lambda eigenspace only contains these two things. Then as a sheep, we'll get a short exact thing that's like this. What is it? Sorry, where, where F well, these models. So F F is the um, I'll write this out. So So say we can find W representation of G and mu such that the fancy W mu shifted such that we have a short exact sequence like this. 
And what is the line? The line here in this red bracket. So this is the uh, eigen sheet of the central character of type. Uh -huh. So, in other words, if we if we take an arbitrary one of these. Lambda may show up in it, um, but when we take this eigensheet, it'll also pick up any of the weight spaces which live in the, the dot orbit. Yeah, so we want to find some W and a weight U such that it's only these two pieces. So in this picture, this like central point would be U, yeah. this whole thing here would be W. We shift it down, yeah. we would find these two. And nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, and such that mu uh, equals k minus one. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so we'd want to find something which not only sits in here but also has this homology vanishing set. And you know, by induction, if we knew this. Uh, if we knew this by induction, that this, this thing vanished, then we would find this middle piece such that it vanishes, and it would uh, kick out induction. So, yes, now this this is really just can we, this is really just a geometry of the like vial chambers and such. Given something on a wall, yeah, essentially, given something on a wall where you're trying to make it dominant. Um, or, or even sorry, not on the wall, just even something, you're trying to make it dominant. Can you find weight spaces, like orbits of weight, such that it's only, like it only intersects it at two spots for a simple equation? Um, yeah, so I'm still quite getting like how does that give us this sort of that sequence? Like, I get how that that kind of splits off as a, as a um, Module in the center, mm -hmm. but then where does this sort of that sequence come from? So, yeah, so so the idea is we would consider the um, like lambda eigenspace with this guy, and we would rig it in such a way that this was like the smallest. Mm -hmm. right, and that, that's sort of what we would do in this picture. Um, or maybe not the like, Maybe not small, but like uh, we would rig it such that we have a map from O and uh, into U, and we know that it would land in the land of eigenspace. Yep. And we know that this was just part of a filtration, and this was just a direct sum. Uh, and the only other part, the only other thing in that filtration ah, was this guy. Ah, yeah. uh, so that would give us this. That's the quotient. Um, and so could we have done the other way around? Uh, so it's important because it's like the quotients are always more dominant. The quotients always have more of those seconds. To do is like the, if you consider this as a the geocomparing bundle, it's, it's not going to be simple to split in the simple as the filtration, right? Mm -hmm. For the filtration, then according to the convention, it starts with like the lowest weight that's in the total uh, that time to build up. And so the point is that like the lowest weight actually in certification will actually have a map. But none of the other things will. Mm -hmm. But when you now consider this eigen uh, composition, none of those things that are lower than lambda will live in this eigen space. And so you can actually split them off and actually think of both lambda. I agree. It requires some like thinking about it. it's really not obvious, but uh, yeah, you combine those two things. So, and also maybe I'll just give the example. So, that's because I, I found it really helpful to just think about P1. Like, for instance, if you start with this, you want to make it dominant. One way would just to be take a two dimensional ref SL2, or alternatively, just like justify why there is a short exact sequence which is like this. Um, this, in fact, comes from SL2. And then Okay, so in this one we didn't we didn't get the shifted action, but we could then shift. You know, say we shift by one. Yeah. 
we get a short exact sequence like this. And you know, these have no cohomology, so that, you know, H naught of here, we've got an H naught of here. Um, and in general, it's all about just yeah, finding the weights which do what you want and then taking items. Uh, but again, so I'm a little bit, I don't know, I don't know if it's worth, because I like, there's just sort of a simple recipe you can use to write down for what this is. Uh, or what something which does this will be, but it's not enlightening. <laughs> it's, it's sort of just, you know, consider this. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, so, so maybe instead of that, I'll give the geometric interpretation of it rather than the actual thing. Because, uh, yeah, like, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't speak to me, and it, it would just be doing some calculations which are not particularly enlightening. But okay, so let's just look at this picture again. So say we want to throw this thing in this thing. Well, we want, we need to pick our sort of base point of this, like we need to pick our pick factor such that it's smaller than lambda, where that this n value is smaller than lambda. And remember, n was the number of simple reflections we need to get it to be dominant. So in this case, where, where, are, we, where are we allowed to reflect? We're allowed to reflect Oh god, it runs terribly. Uh, there. Oh no, second. Where are we allowed to reflect? We're allowed to reflect in this and this. Right? So in order to get from this guy into the dominant chamber, we reflect in this, and then we reflect in this. So that's two steps. Uh, this. You know, only one step. We need to find something which is sort of extreme or which has these as extreme effects, which is only one reflection to get into the dominant chamber. So what if we take something here? Well, and we reflect it to get it in here. So the claim is pick something on this wall, basically. So if you take something in this wall, you reflect it, you get it in here. And if you pick picking something on this wall is essentially saying that these two values are equal. So yeah, so in other words, yeah, you want to pick in this example, we just want to pick some mu which lives on this wall and has like uh, this. So that means this thing. Uh, yeah, so if we picked. Yeah. And we pick mu down here. We went out to there. Like we have a lot of freedom in where we pick. If picking on this wall, all of these choices will have these two things being extreme. And the point is, you want to pick one such that this vector here lands in the dominant chain. So sigma. This thing here is. Because you can imagine maybe if you, like, I don't know, if you, if you move this vector, if you, you know, just consider all the possible choices here that sort of have these two extreme points, if you tried to move this too far forward, it potentially wouldn't work. But it's like, if you pick it far back enough, uh, it will land in the dominant chamber. And that's what you need to show that it's only these two points. So, yeah, so morally, uh, you just pick a dominant weight that has this value being the same. And then that's it. And then you just check that you translate that by the suitable thing and you verify that, that will only have lambda and SL. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like if we call this LEP, which is what Dragon does, this is just pick a dominant weight. Length p in the correct direction. And then if you do this and then you shift it, it will have these two points extremely in the case. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll write down what this is just to be precise, but that is really the, the entire thing. It's like you need to pick a dominant weight which has these two things being extremal, and then you check, well, for a dominant weight, this value needs to be equal to this value, and then that is the 
only we can use it to check. Yes. Let's say that it is dominant and it can be minimally written state of one, state of two, state of k, and set alpha equals the inverse applied to beta one, and then set q negative beta one check lambda, which we can see is greater than zero dominance. Then uh, sigma is dominant weight with beta one check sigma equals q. Then O of lambda minus works. So yeah, this is the we want to find something dominant, and then we can see that for it to be dominant, it has to agree with this wall thing. Uh, but yeah, and then one needs to actually prove that this works, and that's where the dominant comes from. Okay, so maybe now I will. I just want to say something which maybe will come up next week, which isn't quite to do with it. Uh, and I thought maybe if I had time to talk about it, but I definitely don't not for common torque. So I just want to state something so we've seen it and it's not as unfamiliar. Um, but like maybe first off, does anyone have any questions? I realize I didn't really explain the like how it actually goes, but I don't think I want to. Um, so I just want to explain, I want to state the following here. So if we take N is a vector bundle on X equals G mod B, right? where, where N is the you know, nilpotent subalgebra, it's ideal Borel subalgebra that sits over every point, um, then N is actually the uh, tangent bundle. So that means, uh, say, in dual is the cotangent bundle. And the claim is that H i on X of the i exterior power star is a dimension number of elements of the power group of length i and h j x i star equals zero i don't equal okay so all this is just kind of neat uh, and you could imagine that you know we have a uh, more or less explicit bundle. We know exactly what line bundles do. We know how to take exterior powers of vector bundles, decompose into line bundles. You could ask, okay, what cohomology shows up? And this would be saying that, okay, there's actually heaps of things which are vanishing. Uh, and you could even guess sort of where these numbers are coming from. But I want to give a different proof of this result. So there is a combinatorial way to prove this, but I want to give a much uh, nicer proof, which puts this more into context. Um, so, and this is also just an excuse, but if you haven't seen it before, you can see like the Hodge theorem uh, doing something, or like Hodge theorem doing something. So, so the general theorem for X uh, projective over C, then H I of X leads in C. Uh, I'd say maybe 
not quite canonically. P plus Q equals I. H P Q X C where H P Q of C is isomorphic to the heat cohomology. of the Q exterior power of the cotangent one. So, and also we have the HPQ bar equals HQP. Okay, so this, there's like, there's a lot of things so this is you know, topological cohomology, and this here is coherent, you know, algebra, algebraic cohomology. So this one is, you know, resolving the world of coherent sheaves or modules and it computes some stuff, Whereas this is like computer chains or cell decomposition. Uh, and so this is the like Hodge decomposition, which essentially says if you know your projectable over C and smooth, you get this extra structure on your cohomology group for free on all. And furthermore, the cohomology comes from algebra essentially. Like it, it sort of decomposes into these pieces, which are computable entirely algebraic, which is. So you know, this is an awesome theorem, which is absolutely worth knowing. It's complex, uh, projected complex manifold. Um, and what this says in our context, this, this statement here, we can now read as HPQX equals zero if P is not equal to Q and HP P X is H two P X C, where X is our flag manifold, and these are just the dimensions of the cohomology groups of the flag. So, if you haven't seen this before, this is like a really nice computation or a thing to bear in mind. It's like you know these numbers in this way should tell you this is the cohomology of the flag manifold, and the fact that you're getting all of this vanishing and it's precisely on the diagonal is a, yeah, a consequence of Hodge theory of this general vanishing statement, um, which is kind of like, you know, an arbitrary algebraic variety. This kind of tells you that small multi groups naturally live, uh, you know, they're vibrating, they live in a triangle or they live in a diamond. And what this is saying is they actually live in a line. So it's like, there's a lot of vanishing there. Um, and yeah, this this sort of general like living in a line is a positive like you would you this could happen basically only for positive varieties where positive is like you know, your canonical bundle is anti ample like your G mod B your projective space like this is something which happens in that world but not elsewhere like elliptic curves don't have general don't have this it's like this is really uh, a strong another manifestation of that positivity phenomenon. Um, yeah, and so I think I think we'll need to know this. Uh, and it's, it's just like, I don't know, it's just sweet that you get this immediately from Hodge theory. Uh, I don't think so. Because N, there's a brick of N bundle on the chat side. The cotangent but the second. I think you might have gone backwards. I think should be the one right to the five. The Wait, no, no, but I, I can only have like I should have H zero of this thing back. Right? Like oh, is that yeah, so so when j is zero and i is non-zero, it should vanish. So so like this is only when i equals i. When it's j and i, you should always get zero. Okay, fine. But then it's right. The the fiber of the the little g model will be right. The fiber. Yeah, yeah. So little g model of B though is not identified with 
any minus that can be dual. But I mean, turning B, so I'm going to the opposite to so and dual. Mm -hmm. It seems like that. Is that. Uh, it doesn't seem perfect. I'm just. Yeah, well, so, okay, yeah, so is, first off, is this the tangent model or should I really have an M? So you can get the question. Yeah, because like, like, I know I should definitely be taking the cohomology of the tangent model, but it's just like, oh. um, sorry, of the cotangent model. Okay, yeah. yeah, so. And so it's just, is this guy the tangent bundle? No. Okay, yeah, sorry, yeah, so, right, so by that, as you were saying, G mod B, and the claim is that this is isomorphic by the killing form to n dual or n pop. Well, n minus, n minus by the killing form is in fact. And yeah, that's correct. And n minus is in dual by the Wait, is it? Why is G mod? So wait, G mod B is identified with n minus by the killing form. No, no, that, this, is just, that, this is just because. I mean, oh, sorry. Yeah, right, right. yeah this, this is just because it, it lives there. And you probably, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. And now, minus, minus is identified with NDU. Okay, yeah. By killing form, okay. you should get out. No, no. And I think, it's like, right, yeah. So, so, so this, the way you can remember this is that, like, G, little, little G, could live as global sections of the tangent bundle. Like global vector field. So I have some way of taking a like an element of G, producing an element in every fiber, every tangent phase. I can certainly take an element of G and map it to D on B. That's the very thing. And now I say the G on B minus is kind of Or another way of saying it even if I have an element of G, G is like more G dual in the killing form. If I have anything in a dual, I can restrict it. To the dual or the subspace. Like I take something in G dual and restrict it to N dual. But mm -hmm. I can't take something in G and restrict it to N. I've never understood mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, so it. makes sense that it should be N dual. Mm -hmm. Right. And you would, so you wouldn't expect this guy to have global section because it's like over each point, when you, you know, you're modding out by N, right? Like, there's, no, there's no natural way to go from N on G mod B or G mod N. Yeah, fantastic. This is just a sweet theorem, and it's an excuse to revisit the, the Hodge theorem in a, in a different spot. But I, I think I'll stop there.